Good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Wernickoff, and I'm the founder of Champion Athletes, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today on mindset and nutrition for volleyball. Joining me today will be Chad Parks from Winning Mindset. I just introduced myself. I founded Champion Athletes back in 2008. I'm a certified sports nutritionist, and I really spent the last uh, 12 years working with athletes uh, on how to improve their performance through better nutrition. Our company specializes in working with athletes eight to 25 years old. All right, hey, I'm Coach Chad Parks. Uh, I am a high school wrestling coach. I uh, was a wrestler my entire life, but also played football, baseball, um, the son of a coach. So sports have been my life. <clears throat> my wife coaches volleyball. Actually, our head high school volleyball coach is on here, uh, Coach McHenry. And um, so I work for Winning Mindset. With Winning Mindset, we cover the bases. We have coaches for every single sport you can think of. And, you know, for me, I've worked with a number of volleyball teams, a number of individual volleyball athletes. So today I'm going to go through some of our mindset information with you guys and uh, tie it into how we can help you in the sport of volleyball. As we're going through our presentation today, please feel free to ask questions. The more interactive the webinar is, I think the more everybody gets from it. And we're really excited to have such a great turnout today. We actually have 35 people plus Chad and I on our webinar already. So we're really excited about that. If you have access to the chat box, that's the best way to ask us questions and just type them in the chat box. You can type them in at any time. We'll pause during the presentation to answer questions or we'll answer them right at the end. If you don't have access to the chat box, you can text questions to 845-641-3063. That's my cell number. And I'll be happy to read your questions for everyone and then we'll go ahead and answer them. So starting off our presentation, we'll, today will be mindset and Coach Parks will start off for us. All right, so <clears throat> this right here, and I'm gonna go through these slides with you guys. Um, and I'll explain these things as we go, but this right here, this slide says the training paradox, okay? So when I work with athletes, and this is honestly for any sport, um, I have the opportunity to, of course, work with my team, but I travel around the Midwest. I do a lot of camps, clinics, work at a high school association, clinics, things like that as a speaker. And I often ask coaches or athletes, you know, how much of your sport is mental? And pretty much, you know, it, no matter if I'm in Kansas or Nebraska or Iowa, um, or if I get to go somewhere on the East Coast, everybody says the same thing. They say it's about 90% or more, okay? And so I think most of us agree that, you know, a lot of sports are mental. You can be incredibly physical. Um, maybe you're just an elite athlete physically, but if you don't have it together in your mind, you're not going to be able to use that physical ability. So when I ask people and they say about 90%, now here's the paradox. If most people agree that their sport is 90% mental, so if volleyball is 90% mental, why do we train 90% physical and sometimes it's not even 10% mental, okay? Um, I know for me, I've been coaching for a long time, and of course, we're doing technique, we're doing conditioning, we're doing hard workouts, trying to become better athletes. And for years, I would sprinkle in information concerning mindset, concerning the mental side of our sport, but I didn't have like a true system. Okay, until a few years ago, and I started working with winning mindset. But just sprinkling it in doesn't really make sense if 90% of our sport is mental. So we have to make sure that we're focusing on that the same way that we would focus on everything else in practice within our sport. All right, so this next slide this is uh, mindset red flags. These are things that, you know, across the board, and we're going to make this specific for volleyball, but across the board, athletes deal with. All right, uh, coaches, you know, whenever you were an athlete, I'm sure you dealt with this at some time, one time or another, and then you see many athletes that deal with these things. Okay, but so these are some red flags. They should set off a red flag in our mind and say, hey, these are things that we have to address, and they're typically mental. They're not physical things. All right, so uh, careless with swings and attacking. All right, hesitant to call for the set. Sometimes you have an athlete who either just goes for it without thinking, doesn't follow uh, doesn't follow protocol, doesn't do what you guys have been doing in practice. And a lot of times they're just not thinking about it, right? They're nervous and they're kind of freaking out a little bit. Or sometimes it's the opposite. They're getting hesitant. They don't pull the trigger. They don't get out there and um, do what they know they should do. There are many athletes that are better in practice than they are competition. 
And so in practice, they're an absolute monster. And they get their competition, they freeze up, they get too hesitant. All right. They want to just blend in instead of stand out. Um, you know, Michael Jordan, the guy's like, hey, give me the last shot. Even though he missed a lot of them, he made a lot of critical shots. Same thing here when somebody's calling for the set, you know, they're like saying, hey, I want to be involved. I want to jump in here and do my job. Uh, can't shake off mistakes. That's huge. One of the things I love about volleyball. So even though I'm a wrestling coach, um, I always tell, and my wife coaches volleyball and softball, I always tell her volleyball is one of my absolute favorite sports because I love the intensity. I love the fast pace. There's always something going on. Every point matters. It's back and forth. Shaking off mistakes is huge. So if you go out and you mess up, all right, somebody hits one right, you know, right at you and, and you shank it and got a bad pass. Well, you don't want that to turn into two mistakes, right? So you have to have a really short memory. You got to be ready for the next play. And I love that in volleyball, teammates are always getting each other up and, and ready to roll. All right. But if you can't shake off the mistake, you're probably going to make another one, make another one. And then that can become just detrimental, right? Can spiral out of control. So mentally, we have to learn how to forgive ourselves real quick and how to move on to the next play. Um, too worried about your teammates. It's a good thing to think about your teammates, right? But if we're so worried about what they're going to think of us, are they going to be mad at us, things like that, that can begin to get in our head and impede how we're playing. Too nervous before or during a game. Learning how to deal with nerves is huge. Nerves are not a bad thing. Nerves are a good thing, right? Nerves make you faster, stronger, smarter. You have to learn to accept that. You have to learn how to control that. Otherwise, and I think we've all competed in some sport, um, if you're, you know, if you've grown up playing volleyball, I'm sure you've done this one time or another. If nerves get out of control, your feet feel like they're in concrete. You don't feel like you can run, you can slide, you can jump. Maybe things are spinning because everything's too fast right now. So learning how to control nerves, learning how to embrace that and then use that. Okay. Uh, not aggressive, no killer instinct. We got to be willing to go for it. There's nothing better than watching somebody lay out and just barely get to a ball and keep it in play. All right. People that are aggressive and they go after it all the time, that's awesome. If you don't have that, usually it's right between the ears. And so we have to, you know, work with an athlete, help them figure out how to go ahead and use a skill set they have and to be very confident in that skill set. Okay, so our next slide. What is mindset training? Uh, I think mindset has become a has become a term that many coaches or many athletes are now familiar with, right? And we kind of apply a lot of things to mindset. So what is actual mindset training? It is sport specific and it's systematic. So if we are going to work with your team, if we're going to work with your athletes, we make sure that we have people that are very good and understand your sport. It is sport specific. So our mindset training program is volleyball mindset. We have one for football, one for wrestling, one for every sport. But volleyball mindset is very specific for your program and for your athletes. And then the coaches that are going to come in and work with your athletes also know a lot about your sport and coaches you know we're going to get together with you we're going to work with you we're going to figure out exactly um what are the things that you want your team to do what are some pillars of your program and then how can we link these two things up and that's what we do so it is systematic mental skills training okay we have so if i'm going to work with a team we'll have multiple lessons or if i'm working with an athlete we have multiple lessons and this is a curriculum that is literally hands-on. This is a curriculum that you're gonna go through step-by-step, step, actionable steps, things that we can take, we can put into use right now, um, not just giving them fluff, not just giving them something and saying like, hey, we did our mindset part, right? No, we want everything we do to truly count. All right, so it's very systematic in the approach that we use. And we see this as strength training for your mind. You know, I'll get more, you know, I'll get to more on that in a second, but really it is, it's strength training and conditioning for your mind. It is also performance driven. So any mindset training you have should be performance driven. And let me clarify when I say performance driven, that doesn't mean winning. Winning is fun, all right? We all like to win, we all love to win. Um, winning is, or coaching is much easier whenever you're winning. Playing is much easier whenever you're winning. But we've all been in games where you went out and you won the game, but then you look back or you reflect and you think like, man, we played terrible, all right? You did not perform to the best of your ability. And you know that if you go against a tougher team or maybe even the same team again, you're going to have to step your game up. Sometimes you've lost a game, but whenever you look back, you think like we performed really well. We played, they were just better than us today. So we want to make sure that everything we do is performance driven. We want you to put yourself in position. You can't control wins, 
but to put yourself in the best position to possibly be able to win, to bring out the best performance in every one of your players, and then also allow you guys to gel as a team and bring out your best performances as a team. Okay, so we want to maximize your potential. Now, a couple things that mindset training is not. It's not motivational speaking. All right, I'm a motivational speaker. I travel and speak all kinds of places. Motivation is awesome, but motivation without action just lasts for a very limited time. All right, so it's not motivational speaking. Are we going to get your athletes motivated? Absolutely, but we're going to make sure that we're putting all this into action. It's not therapy and it's not counseling. Okay, um, even though our founders have degrees in those areas, the founders of Winning Mindset, this is not meant to be therapy or counseling. Now, I will say, whenever I work one-on-one -on -one with the athletes, um, a lot of things come out just about their life or practice or things in general. And so we talk through those things, but we're always attaching everything back to volleyball. We're going back to volleyball. How can we make you the best volleyball player possible? And the best human being possible, the best uh, student athlete possible, all those areas. All right, so how is mindset training like strength training? Strength training is done year-round. Um, I always tell my athletes this. You can never be too fast. You can never be too strong. All right. So if you're a volleyball player, you can't be too fast. You can't be too strong. You can't jump too high. You can't hit too hard. Uh, you can't be too skilled or have too much technique for your position. Okay. So with strength training, we want to make sure that we're doing this year round. And we typically do. Um, a lot of us, hopefully in this COVID-19 era, will be able to start our strength training programs this summer, be able to do workouts this summer so you can roll right into the fall and be ready to play. That may look a little different than it has in the past, but we're still doing strength training. You're doing in-season conditioning, and then you're doing off-season conditioning, or your athletes are playing another sport, and then you know doing off-season or doing uh, conditioning and strength training within those sports. All right, those things happen year-round as athletes. It's just what we do because we want to be really good at our sport. Now, the mindset training is the same way. It is something that we should and can be doing year-rounds. Right now, as stu as uh, student athletes have been quarantined. All right, is they've been at home and maybe we can't work at, you know, work with them face to face like we typically would. There's a lot of mental training that can be going on. There are worksheets we can be going through. There are videos we can go over. Um, I have athletes that I'm on the phone with. Actually, it was about 10 minutes ago, got off the phone or right before this call with an athlete from Georgia that I work with. All right. So there's a lot of mindset training that we can be doing. This should be year round. It's active training. Um, so if I'm if with uh, within our volleyball program, we have about 50 worksheets that we can go, you know, go through with an athlete, systematic, step by step, going through. Here's a worksheet. We're going to go do this, do this together. We're going to learn this lesson. And then here are things for you to be doing all week long. So we have daily practices. We have week long practices. And these are things that are very simple. It's just like if I'm going to build a habit. Typically, I want to start out with something I can do in like 60 seconds or less, right? And then I do that over and over. I get confident in it. It becomes a habit. I can continue to stack or to build on that. That's what we're doing here. You know, so we're taking these worksheets, we're learning, and we're stacking and we're building as we progress. Uh, different mental muscles that we train. A lot of times with mindset training, we just think about mental toughness. And mental toughness matters. All right. We train that in practice. If we're doing conditioning, we're trying to get more mentally tough. If your athlete is in the middle of a game and this has been high intensity and a fast pace, and your player isn't very mentally tough and they begin to fold, that's going to impact every single person on the team. Mental toughness does matter, but there's more to mindset training than just mental toughness. Okay, so some of the areas that we'll go through with your athletes are this. Self-knowledge or your team. Getting to know themselves, all right? Um, a lot of times athletes just kind of know what they do, but they're not sure why they do it, good and bad. We want to go through and help them really get to know themselves and, and the why behind a lot of these things. Goal setting. We want to practice really good and effective goal setting. A lot of goal setting is kind of like a New Year's resolution. Somebody sets a goal. Maybe we write it in a journal. Maybe we hang it somewhere. We're pumped about it. And then we never look at it again. Ten days later, it fades away. And for most coaches or most teams, you know, you have a goal. You want to win your league or your region or you want to win your state, things like that. Those are kind of big overarching goals. But we want to make sure that we have all these little small goals that we're doing that are going to, again, add up and stack up to put ourselves in position to achieve these big goals. So working on real goal setting and goal setting that is effective. Again, mental toughness, motivation, being in the moment, learning how to relax under pressure, confidence. Confidence is huge. Um, if you have an athlete who is a really good athlete but they're not confident, then it's going to be hard for them to perform well. 
So we're building confidence within the athlete, building confidence within your team. A confident team is a very dangerous team. You add a, you add a high level of skill with confidence and you got a great combination. Okay. And then aggressiveness, uh, clarity, aggressiveness beyond those things, which we can work with individual athletes. We're also teaching leadership skills. So what would it look like if everyone on your, if everyone on your team was a better leader? What would that look like amongst your team? What would that look like in the school? I promise if you want your, if you want your team to matter to your school, if you want your club to matter to your community, then build leadership skills. You make yourselves very valuable at doing that. So we're going to teach your athletes how to become better leaders. Team building skills. Volleyball is one of the ultimate team sports. And if one person is a weak link or if one person is being selfish or if one person can't get over mistakes quickly, it affects everybody else on the court. Okay? And then injury recovery. People get injured. That's just all there is to it in sports. Um, I was a college athlete. And, you know, through high school, through college, I've, I've been in a circumstance where I was injured. And I can tell you that so much of the injury is mental. Um, it's a real physical injury. But knowing that you're setting out while your teammates are competing, that's tough. Not being able to, to exercise or do the things that you would do on a normal basis, that is tough. So as your athletes, or if you are an athlete that's on here, dealing with injuries is a very hard thing to do. But we want to use mindset training to walk these athletes through to understand that there are many things that we can do, and we're going to focus on those while we're injured and not the things that we can't do, because then you'll drive yourself crazy. All right, so we work with athletes on injury recovery and then sleep, um, just recovery in general, right? Dan's going to talk about nutrition for recovery. Sleep is a part of that. So helping your athletes understand good sleep hygiene and how that affects them in life. Here are a few of the teams that we work with, okay? The Princeton Volleyball Club, uh, West, West Fargo High School, North Dakota. Um, and within our sports, I mean, we work with high schools, clubs, Division One, Division Two, NEI, we have a ton of different areas or groups that we train with. And so if you're on here from any of those areas, we probably are working with somebody um, at those ability levels. All right. Now I'm going to go through and give you guys real quick before I turn it over to Dan. This is sort of a pillar or foundational lesson for our athletes and our teams. And this is what we call predator-prey mindset, okay? Predator versus prey mindset. So if we look at this picture, it's a swimming picture, but it's Michael Phelps, one of the most famous U.S. athletes ever. And you can see he's in the lead. His eyes are forward. He's focused. And the guy he's competing against is focused on him. All right. And maybe you've heard the saying, you know, champions focus on champions and, and losers focus on champions. All right. We want to focus on the things that we can control, not the things that we can't. And so we have a little saying within Winnie Mindset is eyes in front like to hunt. Eyes on the side like to hide. Predator versus prey. Okay. A predator animal has its eyes in the front. And when they wake up, they have an objective. They have a goal. They know what they're going to go for. Um, lions, tigers, bears. Are, all right. Oh, my. I live in Kansas. So if I'm any of those animals, I'm waking up and I'm not worried about being eaten. I'm waking up and I'm worried about going and getting food for myself, for my family, taking care of my community. All right. That's what I'm focused on. If I'm an athlete, I want to make sure that my objective, my focus is straightforward. Here's what I want to do. I want to be the best volleyball player I can possibly be. So here are the steps I need to do to get there. All right. Vice versa, you have prey animals, deer and squirrel and rabbits. Um, eyes are on the side. They're freaking out and they're worried about everything else all the time. They're not focused on that one sole objective. And as athletes, we can get into that position. It's a, plat it's a bad place to be. So here's something that we like to use that kind of simplifies this lesson. We like to say that prey mindset is your greatest foe, F-O-E, okay? And the F stands for fan mentality. As an athlete, we don't want to live in fan mentality. Now, if you are a fan of a sport, that's awesome. And as a coach, I try to be my athlete's biggest fan, right? But I'm talking like truly fans. Um, so one of, my, one of our former volleyball players that I did a lot of strength conditioning training with, she plays for Louisville. All right, so I'm a huge Louisville fan, um, and Coach Sammy is on here, so she coached her. You know, we have athletes at University of Nebraska, Illinois, uh, that are starters that are just playing amazing. So I try to watch those teams because I helped uh, train those athletes, strength conditioning, mindset training, things like that. Well, as a fan of those teams, 
I might get on and look and see who they're playing against, what that team's record is, see if I think we can win this game or lose this game. And just it, it's fun to do that as a fan. OK, I'm a huge OU football fan. I'm, I'm like a nerd when it comes to OU football. I'm from Oklahoma originally, and I'm always studying their opponents and seeing if they can win the games. But if you're one of the actual athletes or coaches, it doesn't really benefit us to, to be worrying about that. OK, so if a team that we're playing is ranked, who cares? We can't control that. That's somebody else's opinion. If a team that we're playing against has a really good record, who cares? We can't control that. We can only control what we can do. So I don't want to have that fan mentality where I'm looking at talk forums or social media or rankings or records, or maybe it's a school that's won all these titles. We want to focus on ourselves becoming the best team that we can be and then go out and play. So not living within fan mentality. Fan mentality is great for the parents. It's great for the supporters of your program, but not for the athletes. The athletes got to focus on becoming the best players they can every single day. All right. So the O info is others. Sometimes we get so focused on others, and, and there's a real reason for this. If I'm an athlete, I love my parents, and they're probably some of my biggest fans or my guardians, whoever I live with. I care about their opinion, okay? I love my teammates. I love my coaches. I care about their opinion. But sometimes athletes get so wrapped up in what other people think that they no longer compete to win. They compete not to get beat, and that's a bad place to compete from. So we want to make sure that we're not focused. And I tell my athletes this, hey, guess what? At the end of the day, win or lose, those people that really care about you, they're going to love you anyway, right? So don't worry about what happens if I mess up. What happens if I lose this game? Are they going to still love me? Are they going to care about me? Are they going to be in my corner? Yes, they are. And if there are other people out there from opposing teams or opponents, um, haters, whatever, we're not worried about their opinions either. Their opinion is none of, it's none of our business. Our job is to go in and focus on what we can do so we don't have the other's mentality. Okay, that's a prey mindset, not a predator mindset. And then the E is extras. Extras are things that are not inherently bad, but they can get in our way as an athlete or as a team. Okay, so maybe a video game. Maybe I like playing video games. Cool. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe shooting TikTok videos. Awesome. Those could be good things. But if I'm staying up till one o'clock in the morning and I'm, and I'm, you know, on TikTok, just scrolling or shooting videos or playing video games, now that has impeded my sleep, that has impeded my health, that's impeded my ability to recover and to go out and to practice as hard as I can and play as hard as I can. So extras, again, aren't inherently bad, but they can actually step in, get in the way of us becoming the best version of ourselves. So with our mindset training, we want to make sure that we have this predator mindset and that everything we do is going to help us become the best athlete we can be, the best student we can be, and the best human being that we can be. Those are all things that we want to focus on. Okay. And then this last slide, I won't go through the whole thing, but these are some common thought patterns that you have that are predator thought patterns. These are whenever you played in your best competition versus some of the thoughts that you might have whenever you're not playing well. All right. In your best competition, you're just thinking about here's my technique, here's what I'm going to do versus what my opponent might be doing to me. It's okay to know some of their plays, to know some of their tendencies, but if that's all I'm thinking about, I'm going to forget about the things I'm supposed to be doing, okay? We got to learn to treat all opponents the same. We never overestimate or underestimate somebody. Uh, we don't make any match or any tournament a big deal. So this is hard for athletes to learn. And I've competed um, in national championships, right, as an athlete. I've been on some of the biggest stages. I've also played locally in my hometown. So... Whether it's something local, it's against a school that you've put a whooping on many times or a club that you put a whooping on or you're playing on the national stage or you're playing in the state championships, we can't make it too big in our minds. The good thing is a volleyball court's a volleyball court. Same dimensions, same net, you have a ball, you have people, okay? Those are things that we know coming in. So no matter where we play, no matter what gym we're playing in, we can go in and we can execute the same game plan. We can play with the same intensity. And we can know that it's not a big deal. It's not, it's not too big or it's not too little. We're going to go out and just be very consistent, play our best every single time, no matter what's going on. Okay? Um, I'm going to skip down here real quick. All right? Uh, every point is a new point. Every match is a new match. You can't worry about what happened in the past. If we got scored on, if we lost a match, um, if we lost a set, whatever, it doesn't matter. We're focused on the next thing. We're going to go and improve. And if we lose, you know, if we lose um, a game and, you know, we don't have any more games today, we don't play for a few more days, 
we'll go back a review and we're going to get better but again we're going to have short memories and we're going to always focus on what can we do next to perform at the absolute highest level at the top of our ability so these are all things that we're going to teach athletes and mindset training these are things as coaches and athletes that we got to constantly be thinking about uh, that are very typical for us but sometimes we don't give the athletes the tools to actually do these things we just expect them and i'm guilty of it as a coach just said i mean i've been coaching for 18 years sometimes i just expect them to do things and then i look back i'm like oh, i didn't truly prepare them because i didn't really give them the mental tools they needed to do these things so all right now we're going to combine this with nutrition they go hand in hand so i'm going to turn this over with my man dan all right dan you got it all right thanks chad Sir, uh, before I start, I just want to apologize in advance if I cough a little bit or need to take a drink during the presentation. I live on the East Coast in uh, New Jersey, and in fact, my allergies are pretty bad today. So I'll do my best, but I apologize in advance. So now we're going to talk about nutrition specifically for volleyball. And I think the athlete food pyramid is a great way to kind of start off that conversation because it allows us to talk about the different aspects of nutrition that are pertinent to the athlete. So we're gonna spend some time talking about macronutrients like proteins, carbs, and fats, and how to manipulate those percentages based on what your training goals are. We're gonna talk about nutrition timing, when to eat proteins, when to eat carbs, when to eat fats, to help you get the most bang for your buck and benefit the goals that you have. When to use appropriate supplements and what supplements you could consider. Um, there's probably 10,000 or more supplements available on the market. Some are great, some are terrible and it's good to have a sense about supplements. Sports food is a relatively new food category, probably in the last 10 to 15 years. And those are products specifically that have been developed for athletes, things like protein bars, protein shakes, things like that. And finally, we'll spend a few minutes talking about micronutrients, those things like the vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, those things, even though they're kind of considered micro, they're super important in our diets to make sure we're able to function at our best. So let's start off talking about proteins. Remember the proteins are essential for muscle building and repair. And depending on what your goal is at the time, it could be, it could be anywhere from 20 to 70% of your diet. If you're in a muscle building phase where you're trying to get bigger and stronger and gain more muscle, you wanna have a higher percentage of protein in your diet. If you're in the middle of competition season where having great aerobic activity, super high energy is more important, you'd want your protein <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, your protein percentage to be able to a little bit lower and have your carbohydrate percentage a little bit higher. Remember that they come from both animals and plant sources. And if you have insufficient protein in your diet, you're, subject, you're subjected to anemia, fatigue, the possibility of stress factors and impaired muscle growth. Now, carbohydrates are our main source of energy. And as a general rule, when we talk about carbohydrates, the less processed the carbohydrate is, the longer sustained energy it's gonna give you. That's just kind of like a golden rule of carbohydrates. So if it's a darker color, if it's kind of that brownish color, it's much better than a white carbohydrate as far as sustained energy. So it's our main source of energy in our body. And again, it could be anywhere from 20 to 70%, depending on what your goal is. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about nutrition periodization and periodization is the idea that we're gonna manipulate our diet based on our goals and our train and our period of training at the time. So you can manipulate these nutrients both for a long period of time, like several months, and you can also manipulate them for within a week. You can even manipulate them within a day. So you can say that I'm gonna have more protein in the morning so that I'm feeding my muscles really good in the morning, but then I'm gonna have carbohydrates in the afternoon to get ready for a competition that late afternoon or evening. So these nutrients, the more you manipulate them, the more you use them to your advantage, the more you'll get out of them. And finally, we have fats. And people think that, you know, low fat diets have been something that's very popular. A high fat diets can be popular as well. Remember that fats are an essential part for sustained energy. Our bodies really have two energy modes. There's aerobic metabolism, which means we're using air to burn energy. And then there's anaerobic metabolism where we're using, we're not using air and we're using stored fat. So in order to have anaerobic metabolism, we need to have stored fat for that sustained energy. It's part of proper digestion. People who don't have enough fat in their diet have a lot of digestive issues, suffer from constipation and other problems with their digestion. 
It's also the base for most of our hormone production. Both testosterone and estrogen are fat-based. So if your body fat is too low or you're not eating enough dietary fat, you can have difficulties with your levels of essential hormones. Fat should be between 10 and 40% of your diet. As a general rule, as you bring the protein level up, fats <coughs> are going to increase as well. So really fat kind of follows protein in a sense. And remember that they're sourced from both animals, fruits like avocados, beans, nuts, and seeds. Now water to me is that should be that third, uh, fourth macronutrient because it's so essential for our bodies functioning properly. And one of the most common things that I see in clients in my office, and they can be really high level athletes to eight to eight year olds just kind of getting started, that as soon as we improve their hydration, their performance level goes way up. So remember that water helps energize our muscles. If they're not well hydrated, our muscles don't function properly. They're very important for concentration. The most common reason why school age uh, children and teenagers have headaches is dehydration. So often I'll see a client who has repetitive headaches, they've had all kinds of tests and they're not getting rid of them. So they'll send, they'll come in for nutrition screening, looking for things like dyes and things in their diet that can give them headaches. And very often all I need to do is put them on a strict water hydration program where they're drinking water starting early in the morning and throughout the day and their headaches magically disappear. Especially younger people are concerned about their skin and appearance and acne, so water helps reduce those things. It makes sure that our kidneys function properly and helps us go to the bathroom regularly. There's nothing worse than trying to compete in a tournament where you're jumping constantly and being constipated, having a bloated stomach because you're not able to go to the bathroom. So hydration plays a big role in our bowel function. Here's a little table for you about our micronutrients. And you really wanna make sure that as you're putting a meal plan or a diet plan together, that you're including all your micronutrients into it. So I just wanted to point this out to you. You wanna make sure that you're considering that you're getting all your A vitamins, your B vitamins, all your other vitamins in your plan, as well as your omega-3 fatty acids. Anemia is something that we commonly see in athletes. Um, especially running athletes quite a bit or athletes that are running a lot or are pounding their feet on hard floors. So that's why I brought this up for volleyball. Athletic anemia is a condition where the little capillaries on the bottoms of your blood, uh, the bottoms of your feet leak red blood cells from the constant pounding on the bottom of your feet and athletes become anemic from it. So some of those early signs of anemia can be fatigue, some shortness of breath or just kind of labored breathing, more short of breath than you were previously as well as muscle weakness. So if any of those things are going on, you may want to consider increasing the amount of dietary iron in your diet. And some of the, these are some of the different areas where you can get iron from. So especially if you're not eating any red meat for one reason, your iron could be lower. So make sure you're getting enough dark green leafy vegetables. Um, egg yolks contain a good source of iron, dried fruit, and a lot of the legumes do as well. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I really believe that sports are a marathon and not a sprint. So nutrition periodization is the concept of looking at your entire year and planning your nutrition goals around that so that you're peaking during your competitive season and you're also allowing your body to continue to grow and mature. At Champion Athletes, we specialize in youth and adolescent athletes, 8 to 25 years old. So we're always concerned that our athletes are continuing to grow and mature appropriately and that anything they're doing for their sport doesn't impede that. So we'll start off by kind of mapping out an entire year for them and what some of those nutrition goals may be. There's that preseason period, a few months before the season starts when you're starting those preseason practices. What should be your goals during that time? Do you need to get a little stronger? Are you trying to increase your speed? Are you trying to work on your endurance? And manipulating your nutrition to support that goal. <laughs> Then as you move into the season, you're probably looking to have a little bit higher carbohydrates in your diet, a little bit lower protein to give you that extra energy, especially on game days or on days where you'd be having a tournament and playing multiple games on the same day to make sure you have great sustained energy during the in-season. And then as you're setting off-season goals, maybe your goals are to gain muscle. Maybe you need to be lifting and working out harder. So during the off-season, 
might be a time that you want to be on a higher protein diet to encourage that muscle growth. So the big question is, where do I start this? If I want to make some of these changes, if I want to manipulate my diet to help my performance, where do I start? And the best place to start is with a body composition analysis. And to get a body composition analysis, <coughs> you can see a nutritionist like myself. Many gyms offer a scale uh, body composition analysis, like the scale that's pictured on the slide. There are also tools you can download for free off the internet. Well, when you're looking at a body composition analysis, we're looking at your weight, but more importantly than your weight itself, how much of that is body fat? How much of that is muscle mass? Do you need to increase your body fat so you have better sustained energy? Or are you carrying too much body fat that you want to lean down a little bit to increase your energy? How's your muscle mass? How does it compare to other athletes in your position on the court? Is my muscle mass too low? Do I need to start lifting harder? Or could my muscle mass be too high and it's affecting my ability to perform? How's my hydration status? And finally, my BMR. What is my basal metabolic rate? Which means if I laid in bed for 24 hours, did absolutely nothing, how many calories my body needs to maintain its current weight? We take that number and we add a number for daily living, like going to school, hanging out, working, whatever you do. And then we add numbers for all your physical activity. So if you're practicing six days a week, if you're lifting on top of that, if you're running on top of that, whatever you're doing, then we add those numbers up and we get a grand total. <clears throat> that number is your calorie load. And that's the number of calories you need to maintain your current weight. If you want to gain weight, you're going to need more. And if you're going to want to lose weight, you're going to need less. And where those calories come from is going to affect both what happens to your body and how you feel. So a higher protein diet is going to allow you to gain muscle. But if, you're, if your protein levels are really high, like a keto kind of diet, you're going to sacrifice energy. If your carbohydrates are really high and your protein's really low, you could lose muscle if you're working out really hard because you're not feeding your muscles properly. You'll have great energy, but if one of your goals is to lose excess body fat, that's going to become more difficult because our bodies like to store carbs. So how you manipulate your proteins, carbs, and fats are going to depend on how you get to your goal. Now, when you're going into competition, So we talked about really how to change your diet. And now let's talk about competition because everybody needs a nutrition plan. So a good nutrition plan is gonna help you meet your performance objectives. It's gonna become predictable. It's gonna mean that your nutrition is predictable, that you're getting in the right amount of macronutrients, the right amount of micronutrients. You can make sure you're getting in all your hydration. And by having a plan, it reduces stress and anxiety because you don't have to worry about your food. Think about how much time you spend per day thinking about, oh, what should I have for dinner tonight? What do I need to have for breakfast for tomorrow? Do I have the right groceries in the house? If you have a nutrition plan that you spend some time working and developing, then you have a plan and that goes out the window. You know what you're gonna have for breakfast every day during the week. We build a seven day plan for our clients with a grocery list. So they don't even have to think about that. They know what their meals are gonna be. They have them prepped. A lot of our clients do meal prep on one day a week. So they're ready to go for the week. Now, I skipped ahead a little bit before, but I was mentioning as you're getting into competition, make sure you're hydrating. So water's always the great way to hydrate. <coughs> Electrolyte drinks like Pedialyte and Gatorade are very popular. But we've been recommending these two supplements lately for our clients as well, especially clients that suffer from cramping or do excessive sweating. So sometimes we'll do a sweat test to find out how much our clients are sweating, if they sweat an extensive amount and they have a lot of cramping type issues, we'll recommend one of these supplements. So the right stuff was developed by NASA to help the astronauts rehydrate. It's a powder that you can add to Gatorade or you can add it to water and it's a super hydration powder. And the same thing with liquid IV. These are both designed to be high in minerals and help you rehydrate faster and maintain that hydration level for a longer period of time. As a nutritionist, I'm often asked, what should I be eating before competition? And a lot of that has to do with when, from the time you wake up and tell your competition, how much time do you have? Do you have time for a meal? If you have time for a meal, that's great. And think about what you should be eating in that meal to make you feel great during competition. 
if you don't have a lot of time before your competition, these are the kind of things that we recommend our clients eat. So about an hour before competition, <clears throat> we recommend a good protein drink. So these core powers are non-dairy, but they have 26 grams of protein. They're portable, really easy to bring with you. You can even freeze them so that when you go to open them up, they were super cold. If you take them out of the freezer a couple hours later, they're super cold. That's a great option. If your stomach doesn't necessarily agree with kind of a milk-based type product, we tend to recommend Treminia, which is a fruit-based drink that's also high in protein. So both of them are liquid forms of protein. We recommend liquid because it gets into your body about 30% faster than solid food. So it really gets absorbed quickly and it helps with hydration. Other good options are like the peanut butter and honey sandwich and, of course, great fruit. If you're going to be playing multiple games on the same day, we also recommend that you have a competition plan. And this is just kind of a sample of something that we do for some of our athletes. So after their first match, they're going to hydrate and they're going to maybe have a protein bar. Then they're going to, after their second match, they might have like a turkey sandwich, a banana, and 16 ounces of Pedialyte. In either case, if you're going to be playing multiple games on the same day, you want to have a plan for how to eat and hydrate in between your different games. This example that I hung up happens to be of wrestlers. So they weigh in in the morning and then they have their different matches. But if you don't have to weigh in in the morning, you can kind of take the foods that I have here as examples and manipulate them into your own plan for competition nutrition. One point I'd like to bring up about competition nutrition that I think is really important is you don't want to try your nutrition right before an important game, right before an important tournament. You should be testing these foods at practices and see how good you feel after you eat them. You should pick a Saturday morning practice and have breakfast just like you would at a Saturday morning tournament and then have a hard practice and see how your body feels. Everybody's body reacts a little differently. So we work really hard at Champion Athletes about helping our athletes develop a competition nutrition plan, what to eat the night before, what to eat the morning of competition, and what to eat throughout the day of competition, and we test it. So when they go into competition, they know exactly how their body's gonna feel. There's nothing worse than traveling a bunch of hours and working really hard for a competition and then not feeling well when you get there because you ate the wrong food, having diarrhea, constipation, whatever it might be. So developing a good competition plan is super important. Chad talked about before controlling the things you can control. This is a great example. If you have plans for what you're going to eat, what food to bring, you're prepared, you're controlling something that the competition is probably not controlling, and it's only going to help you to be more successful. So as champion athletes, we help our athletes and help our clients with all aspects of nutrition around their sport. We begin with that detailed body composition and growth analysis. Then we build them a customized meal plan and we coach all of our clients to help them make sure that their plan's working and they're hitting the goals that we're expecting. We then reassess and keep changing up the plan to make sure we're progressing their nutrition along with their sport. Okay, let's open it up to questions. Feel free to ask questions either to Chad or myself. Like before, you can type them in the chat box or if you don't have access to the chat box, feel free to text them to Okay, Yu Chen, are you recommending for a volleyball player to eat, drink something after each match during a tournament day of state instead of waiting till lunch after two or three matches? Yes. I believe that grazing throughout competition is the best thing you can do. There, it really doesn't make sense to plan on eating a big meal after two or three games because once you eat that big meal, you're going to kind of get that uh, Thanksgiving coma that everybody talks about and it's going to lower your energy. It's much better to be grazing throughout the entire day. Now, you may have to adjust that based on how much time you have in between 
your game. So I know that every sport's a little different. Every league is a little different. Um, but generally, if you have at least 30 minutes in between games, it's a great time to grab a bar, grab some hydration, grab a half a sandwich, something like that, that you know is going to sit easy on your stomach, but give you good sustained energy for your next game. Chad, I think the next question is for you from uh, Darian. How do you stimulate... How do you simulate in game pressure in your mental training? Yeah, hey, good question. Um, we have an entire section about learning to relax under pressure. So I'll give you uh, two things real quick that we go over. One is teaching our athletes how to um, how to deal with or understand your your SNS system. All right. So basically, fight, flight, or freeze. So how to understand that? How to understand nerves? what they mean, learning to accept them, uh, learning to use that to, uh, like I said earlier, be faster, stronger, smarter, those type of things. And then another one that we like to use a lot that we can simulate during practice is uh, we teach what we call a reset button, all right? So you wanna actually be in practice and we're going like live situations in practice or live games in practice, um, you know, you could have music loud. You could be scrimmaging against somebody else. Whatever you want to do to physically simulate that pressure, okay? And then with the reset button, what we do is uh, we teach the athletes how to immediately, and we actually use this for pregame, and then we use it like in the game, and I make them practice it, how to reset your brain. So the good thing about our, our mind is athletes cannot think about our people. We can't think about two things simultaneously. Now, there's a lot going on in your subconscious and your preconscious, but we can't focus on consciously two things at once. So if I'm going to have a reset button, we teach athletes how to have a verbal cue and how to have a physical cue that we're going to do to be able to reset or refocus our mind. So if I'm out there actually playing and maybe I make a great play or maybe I make a terrible play, whatever, but I feel like I need to refocus or maybe I'm, I'm too hyped up, right? And I'm I'm getting nervous. I'm kind of freaking out a little bit. As a coach, I'll yell this too, all right? We have a code word. We call it getting in the blue. But I'll just say, hey, get in the blue, all right? And then the athlete is actually going to use the reset button. And you're going to allow each of your athletes to develop their own. So it needs to be a real short phrase. And I won't do the whole the whole program here, but a, re a real short phrase, like three words or less, all right, that the athlete can say and maybe like, I got this, something that similar or that simple. Okay, I got this. So they're going to say that out loud, and then they're going to have some sort of physical action. And what's cool is once you learn this, you'll see a lot of high-level high athletes in every sport would do this. So it might be something like reaching down and like sliding your knee pad down and back up into position. That just looks normal. It's a normal-looking action, but you're doing it intentionally to reset your brain. All right? So if I begin to get too nervous or to freak out or to get off track mentally, I'm going to say, I got this. I'm going to slide my knee pad down and back. Um, so the good thing is now I've taken my brain off of freak out mode, which I like to call being in the red back to being in the blue, which is like in a calm, cool, collected space, ready to refocus. And this can happen like that, but we have to practice it. So if we want to simulate high pressure situations, we create those in practice and then we implement some of these type of things. Um, but again, we have a whole section on learning to relax under pressure and how to, how to have a system to think about that before we ever even actually get out there under pressure. Hopefully they answered it well for you. All right, great. Chad, our next uh, question is from Alfita. I know about water intake, about how much water would you recommend for an athlete to drink? So that's always a great question. So a simple rule would be that your base hydration level should be no less than half your body weight in ounces of water per day. But then you need to drink more on top of that based on practices and based on competition. So your base amount of water should be half your body weight in ounces of water per day as a minimum. And then you need to hydrate more on top of that based on what your activity level is going to be, what the climate's going to be as it gets warmer out. If you're playing outside, if you're playing volleyball outside, you're going to need to hydrate more. If you're playing in, a, in an air-conditioned gym, it could maybe be a little bit less. So you're going to have to adjust that based on the amount of activity you have. Um, Emma asked a great question. Is there a good app to download to track nutrients and stay on track with goals? And then Jenna typed back, I use my fitness pal and it helps a lot. And I was going to recommend my fitness pal also. I just want to make a distinction though. There's a difference between tracking your nutrients, 
using something like my fitness pal, which is kind of at the back end compared to planning your nutrition with a nutrition plan. When you plan with plan your nutrition with a nutrition plan, you're being proactive and you're making sure that you're getting all the nutrients you need per day into your diet. When you use tracking software, you're basically waiting till the end of the day to see if you hit your goals. Now you can use the two things together, which is how they work the best, which is first have a plan, track your plan and make sure you're hitting the goals you're looking for. But I don't recommend that you just use tracking software and kind of track your nutrients as the day goes on because you may not get to the goals you're looking for by the end of the day. It would be much better for you to plan seven different lunches, seven different dinners, seven different breakfasts, and a whole bunch of snacks. And know that if you're eating those throughout the day, you're going to hit your nutrition goals that you're looking for. It also takes some of the stress out of it. It can be very stressful if you're using tracking software to make sure you're hitting your goals each day. Any other questions, Chad or I can answer for you. So if you'd ask athletes who cramp a lot, what can uh, help with that? So there's a few things we recommend for athletes that cramp a lot. The first one is to make sure that they're drinking enough water on a regular basis. So they're at least hitting that minimum amount of water. And then they're drinking more on top of that. Any of the electrolyte things that I talked about are good possibilities to consider. Um, a lot of our clients that suffer from muscle cramps, we put on magnesium um, every day because magnesium helps with muscle conduction. So it very often prevents uh, muscle cramps in our athletes. The other thing you could consider is adding pink salt to your diet. The Himalayan or pink salt adds a lot of minerals into your nutrition and can be a really good preventive for cramps. The goal is really to find what works for you and prevent cramps before they happen, not try to take care of cramps once they start, because once cramps start, it's very difficult to leave them in the middle of competition. Uh, so someone asked me, is there a good app to count macros? That was just texted to me. Um, my fitness pal would probably be the best one that I would recommend to track your macros. It works great and it's free. We have one other person typing, so we'll wait for their question to come in. Uh, here we go. Any recommendations about taking sleep, about talking sleep to high school athletes? So I think both Chad and I can speak on this. I'll go ahead and speak first and then I'll have Chad speak after. Sleep is the basis for our body's ability to recover. And there have been several studies about how improving sleep and sleep quality improves athletic performance. One of the Midwestern football teams just did that. They're actually tracking sleep using um, a smartwatch and they're making sure their athletes are getting enough sleep per day. And if they're not, they're requiring them to take a nap. And then they're helping them get better sleep. And they've seen great improvement in practices and performance by improving their sleep. So I think the first part is educating athletes about how important sleep is, and then challenging them to log their sleep for a week and compare their performance. Do it as a game. See who can get the most amount of good quality sleep and try to make it something that's important for your team um, behavior. Chad? Yeah, so every one of those things are, are right on. Um, so when we talk with our athletes about sleep, you know, we wanna make sure that they understand the, the vitality there, right? Literally, it's one of the only things that your body like just makes you do. Okay, there are things like your heart just beats, that's, you know, that's something we don't have to worry about controlling, but. You have to make yourself go work out. You have to make yourself eat. You have to make yourself do it. You don't have to make yourself sleep. Eventually, you're going to fall asleep. 
um, it is a way for our body literally to reset, repair, clear out your brain, and then let the functions of your body go to work so that you can recover and then train harder the next day. So make sure that we're explaining all those things to athletes. That's big. Um, another thing is knowing that whenever you're young and your hormone levels are, are higher in a lot of areas than they will be later in life, um, sleep is very important for that, which is going to help in strength and help in recovery. But then not everybody needs the same amount of sleep. Now, typically, I mean, we're looking anywhere from 8 to 12 hours of sleep for teenagers, depending on the person. And so one suggestion I have right now that we're in this um, school is about to be out or we're in this quarantine period. If your athlete doesn't have to get up real early right now, then this is something I would I would challenge them to do. Maybe they go to bed at midnight don't set your alarm for a few days. So like Dan was saying, we're gonna track our sleep, but just don't set your alarm, go to bed and see what time you get up. If you do that, and let's say for consecutive days, you slept for 10 hours or in between nine and 10 hours, you know that that's probably about the amount of sleep that your body actually needs, all right? We were able to track it naturally, that's what our body did. So during the season, we need to make sure we plan our, our sleep schedule. Like what are we doing, sleep hygiene before bed and then getting in bed in time to be able to get that amount of sleep and being very disciplined on that. Um, but for some people, and especially us as adults, we don't typically need as much sleep. You know, we may be sleeping seven hours a night and that may be, that may be enough for us. So not, there's, no, uh, there's no exact game plan on that. There's a lot of science on it. But in general, younger athletes, high, middle school, high school and college, they need more sleep. All right, everyone, that kind of brings our presentation today to a close. We'd like to thank everyone for participating and feel free to send us questions or follow up with us. Our contact information is here on this slide. I have gotten a few email requests for the slides from today's presentation and I will be sending those out. And also um, this webinar has been recorded. So you'll be able to um, view this webinar on both the Winning Mindset website and on the Champion Athletes website or on YouTube, it will be available as well. So thank you everybody for your time today. We hope everybody stays safe and healthy. Chad, any final remarks? No, hey, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Hopefully it's the information you can take and use. And then feel free to contact us. Uh, we work with athletes all around the nation. And, uh, you know, we'd love to be able to work with your individual athletes, you as an athlete, or with your teams. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much.